Last week on the Damage Report, we talked about a new study showing that insect populations globally, a significant percentage of them, are either dwindling or endangered at this point, which was certainly scary news. And joining us now on the show to add some expertise to our commentary is a biologist and author Paul Ehrlich. Paul, welcome to the show. Great pleasure to be here. I, actually, it's not a great pleasure because <laughs> we're true. all scared out of our minds. That's People, true. Um, you know, who uh, well, cares about insects? Well, <laughs> I care about insects because they are essential parts of our life support systems. If you like breathing and eating, you got to care about insects. Uh, and the the report was stunning in one sense, but those of us who've been involved in research in these areas for a long time are not surprised at all. In fact, if you're my age, you probably remember uh, that 50 or 60 years ago, if you drove around the eastern United States or even in the deserts, your car got coated with moths. Uh, there used to be so-called moth snowstorms. Now, you don't find them at all. You don't have to pick things out of the radiator of your car so it doesn't overheat. Uh, there was a butterfly, a beautiful butterfly in the east called the zebra swallowtail that used to occur in thousands in mountain valleys and so on. I collected butterflies in the east for more than 50 years and I caught one. So I've known for a long time, we've actually studied populations of insects right on Stanford campus and watched them disappear uh, as a result of climate change, of one of the big factors as well as lots of others. And as some of you know, the monarch butterfly, which you're looking at now, uh, is declining very rapidly everywhere. And these are, you can think of them as the canaries in the coal mine. We're losing biodiversity. People don't know really exactly what biodiversity is, but the important thing is that it supports our lives. The most obvious thing, for example, is pollination, where you probably read about the problems with honeybees and so on. But what we haven't read about very much is the fact that many, many native pollinators have gone extinct. Their populations have disappeared, which would, which is what makes us so dependent on things like honeybees. So it's a grim situation. It's part of a general grim situation of existential threats like climate disruption, like the fact that we've poisoned the planet from end to end and are seeing sperm counts drop in human beings as one possible result and so on. Uh, we're not paying enough attention. We're certainly not paying enough attention to climate disruption, which is one of the main things that's helping to wipe out the insects uh, and is going to help wipe out our civilization if we don't pay a lot of attention. So uh, what can I tell you? <laughs> it's, it's really cheery news. If you like fermented <laughs> grape juice, consuming it uh, will make the whole situation seem much, much pleasanter. <laughs> okay, well, I, I might have to do that after this. Uh, my next question was going to be, uh, was, I know sometimes when these big studies come out, you know, there'll be a write-up in the New York Times or the Guardian, and uh, people in the media who don't have scientific training can sometimes either interpret them inaccurately or go too far. Um, I'm assuming at this point you're, you're thinking that the media is not necessarily going too far in assuming that reporting, for instance, that we're losing 2.5% of insect biomass per year is, is actually as scary as it initially sounds? Well, that, that's, those are good data. In other mm -hmm. words, people have actually done studies, two, whether it's 2.7, 3.4, and so on is a different issue. Uh, but the media have, uh, I think, been too tamed. And I think it's because scientists have been too tamed. Um, a very famous climate scientist said there's a problem with scientific reticence. The scientific community is scared out of its mind. It has presented several times uh, statements about the future of humanity saying we're in great trouble from overpopulation, overconsumption and not paying attention to the existential threats that civilization is facing. And that has not gotten the coverage that it should have gotten. And most scientists tend to say, well, if we just, for example, we can feed more people if we don't waste so much food. Well, we're adding huge numbers of people to the population all the time. We've been talking about not wasting food since the 1950s. Uh, and yet we now waste more food uh, now than we did in the 1950s. Uh, so uh, the things that we have to do really will involve changing our lifestyles very dramatically. And frankly, I don't see any big sign of it. 
Well, that, that's actually where I'd like to turn to now. So uh, for people watching this video, so on the individual level, but also at the government level, um, what do you think could be done to, in, in a sort of reasonable fashion, deal with the, the, the threats that we face at this point? Well, talking about reasonable with the present government, as you just saw in your mm -hmm. last segment, <laughs> uh, is a sort of silly thing. But in fact, climate disruption is a national emergency, is a thing that is going to wreck our economy, wreck our country, wreck the world if we don't start right now doing really dramatic things about it. We've wasted 20 or 30 years uh, while the scientific community has been warning of just talking about it and not doing anything really effective. Yes, we have a little more uh, renewable energy. Uh, yes, we are driving more electric cars, although the big problem is just too damn many people and too damn many cars. Uh, <laughs> but we're not uh, really declaring an emergency. And the existential threats to humanity are a genuine emergency. They're not a fake emergency like the current one. Uh, and they are not recognized by either our government or uh, to the large degree the media. When was the last time you heard somebody say that the problem with the disappearance of insects and the huge fires in California, New Zealand and, uh, and uh, Tasmania right now are caused fundamentally by too many people and too many rich people and middle class people consuming too much? You don't get that. You get that it's climate change, but you don't are not told that uh, about 35% of the greenhouse gases that go into the atmosphere come from the food system. Mm -hmm. The more people you have, the more you're going to have to try and grow more food, the more problems you're going to have with the insect disappearance. Uh, I'm really trying to be cheerful for you. What can <laughs> I, I can tell? tell. I can tell. <laughs> That's okay. On Mondays, we always start scary. We try to end with a little bit of optimism on Fridays, but we're not there yet. <laughs> okay. uh, so I guess my last question for you then is, um, in these issues, the, the big environmental issues with climate change being probably the single largest, I, I feel, maybe I'm in a bubble, but I feel like back 15 years ago with an inconvenient truth, people started to talk about it a little bit and then it died off and people stopped caring as much. Do you feel like now with talk of a Green New Deal at the national level, these you know extreme weather events, you know, usually producing at least a little bit of conversation around climate change, do you think that we might have a window where people are ready to take this, this stuff seriously for once? I pray we have a little window, but I can't be super, uh, I can't be super optimistic about it. The basic issue in our country is follow the money. As long as people are making huge amounts of money, the very, very rich want to see us continue doing the things that they do, the, the famous uh, system of taking from the poor and giving to the rich, uh, the uh, Hood Robin system that we've adopted. <laughs> if you can't change that, uh, if you can't stop the politicians from saying we'll solve it with growth, and the economists saying we'll solve it with growth when growth is the disease. I can't be optimistic, but again, there's always the fermented grape juice. There you go. Uh, so for everyone watching the show, at least we have that. Uh, uh, Paul Ehrlich, thank you uh, for joining us on the show. I really appreciate your perspective. My great pleasure, thank you. Thank you very much for watching this clip from the Damage Report. If you liked it, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and ring the bell on YouTube to get notifications of our new videos. And of course, you can catch the full Damage Report live every weekday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific on TYT Network on YouTube TV.